uh, educational institutions, religion, and a very recent phenomenon. In the last two decades, it has come up as a very potent social institution that constructs realities, is called, starting with M. Media. 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 Yes. So it's media then, which uh, is uh, which is playing a very important role in construction of social realities. And then comes this politics of representation. That how, um, if you have power of uh, media, how you can represent and uh, how you can construct identity. Right? If you are powerful, you can create a very powerful identity for yourself, <coughs> very glorified identity for yourself, and a stigmatized identity for others. Right? Now, if you look at these social institutions, we talked about uh, family and <coughs> um, educational institutions, religion, and <coughs> They play a very important part in shaping their beliefs and constructing social realities. Um, interesting thing is that all of them <coughs> are using one tool. And what is that? Language. That is language. <coughs> so now you can realize that how important is language. That all social institutions are using this tool. So uh, this means that language is not neutral, it is not passive, and it is not innocent. This means that language is a highly political phenomenon, <coughs> highly political phenomenon, which is directly linked with power. Now when we say this, uh, that language is linked with power, uh, you must be thinking about it. How can language be linked with power? Uh, and here I will ask you, that, uh, can you think of what is your view of uh, uh, power and powerful person? What comes to your mind when uh, you think of a powerful person, a powerful uh, you know, country, you know, Usually, yeah. <coughs> being influential, being influential on others is right. being powerful. Okay. Yeah. If, if nowadays, if you have a grip on this language, especially English, you seem to be more powerful. Right. You know, maybe economically more powerful. Okay. You see, again, the conservative view about a powerful person is the person who has got some gun in his hand or a stick, right? Because a well-built person is powerful. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it is true to some extent, because if we look at different levels of power, one way of defining power is that the ability to make others do things, mm -hmm. which otherwise they won't do. If you have that ability, you are powerful. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. And uh, if you have a gun and stick in your hand, you can do that. Yeah. Exactly. Right? So this is one layer of power. But another layer of power is the ability to make others behave the way you would like them to behave. And otherwise, they won't behave like that. Right? Yeah. Again, this is power. And again, if you have done a mistake in your hand, or if you have authority. Influence, authority. Authority means that if you have a legal debt, you can do that. But there are other levels of power as well. Let me share with you another level of power. The ability to make others think the way you would like them to think. And otherwise, they won't think like that. Can you uh, see the role of gun or stick here at this level? No. No. <coughs> Why? Because we cannot think, change thinking of people 
because the gun can impact your body. Yeah. Right? The gun can control your body. To control your mind and thinking, something else is needed. Right? And we'll see in a minute what is there to something else. So, uh, we talk about the way to make the, the way you like it. Still, another level of power is the ability to make others feel the way you, you may like want. Them feel. Yeah. And otherwise, they won't feel like that. Again, can you see the role of Ghana stick here? No. no. Let's go up and see another level of power the ability to make others see things the way you would like them to see. And otherwise they won't see like that. Can you see the role of Ghana stick here? No. No. Okay. Here we, we revisit our notion of power. That power is not just coercion. Power is not just use of force. But there is another dimension of power. Have you heard this name, or read this name? This is M. Gramsci. No? Yes. Okay, this is SCI, but uh, you pronounce it as Gramsci. Today when you go home, uh, Google this name. Right? Gramsci was the person who for the very first time uh, discussed this idea of hegemony and control in his book, Prison Lord Go. And uh, he came up with uh, this thesis that you can hegemonize people are groups with two approaches. There are two ways to control others. One is through political society, which means use of army, use of policy, or use of brutal uh, uh, bureaucracy. In other words, use of force. But the other way of controlling others is through uh, civil society. Here, no coercion, no force is used. But other, uh, you know, there are other ways of control through education, through literature, through language, through civilization, through culture. You control the mind. Right? In the first way, when you use force, this is controlling the body. So, these two approaches political society, society and civil society. This is using force, coercion. But this is not using coercion. But through literature, through culture, through, in a very subtle manner, you control the minds. Right? And here, if you look at all these, uh, you know, language and uh, literature, again, what is being used as a tool? Language. <laughs> and uh, when you talk of language, one step ahead is discourse. Right? The social norms of that society. When we utter something or we try to comprehend, we have to keep those norms with us. Um, in other words, if we look at this, one way is coercive approach. And the other way of controlling others is discussive approach. Can somebody tell me what is meant by discussing? To do with discourse. So one way of controlling others is through discourse. And according to Gramsci, the second approach, discursive approach, where we don't use power, is more effective. Why? Because in this approach you control minds. And 
the height of this hegemony or control is that the group which is being conquered, they start thinking that the aggressor or the dominant group has every right to conquer us because we are in fear in terms of our aggressors, in terms of our food, in terms of our culture, in terms of our language and literature. So they are superior and they have every right to conquer us. And Gramsci uses a term spontaneous consent that the marginalized groups are groups which are being conquered. They give consent, come and conquer us. We are in fear. And all this is done in a very subtle manner by, by constructing a certain discourse. And uh, another person you have to Google is Foucault. This is uh, written as Foucault, but it's Foucault. Uh, who believes that there is a nexus of power and knowledge. And there is, if you look at this triangle, this is power, this is discourse. A power person or group or country is in a position to create a certain discourse, construct a certain discourse. And it has all those resources to legitimize, to popularize, to advocate that discourse. This discourse into a certain social reality. And that social reality justifies all the actions of this power. So, uh, this nexus this nexus power and knowledge they could have. And uh, you know, gone are the days when we used to look at the definition of, of power and powerful by Marx, that whoever is in the position of the sources of production is powerful. Now the definition is changed. In contemporary times, a powerful person is that person. Uh, a powerful group is that group which is in the position of sources of production of knowledge. So if you have that with you, you are powerful. In the center of whole debate is discourse. Whoever is in the position of discourse is powerful. That is why if you look at these movements, whether it is post-colonial or feminist movements, the whole battle is who gets the who who could snatch discourse. This battle is going on. So I think we started our uh, discussion that how lucky you are that you are studying this phenomenon called language, and how important it is to study language, and how powerful. Uh, phenomenon and how political it is that it has a direct link with power which is used to control minds, not just for minds. But at the same time, and I, that is my last point, that language is not just used by imperialist forces to control uh, minds or to for hegemony but language has also been used to put up resistance. So, as I said, if you look at the post-colonial movement, or uh, feminism, right, they are again using language to put up resistance, what they call reversal of the discourse. I think I should stop here, and um, uh, it was wonderful to uh, interact with you, and uh,